Hey, welcome back. So my last video was about what it looks like for you to make the best possible pull request you can. And this time, like I promised, we're going to be talking about what it looks like for you to review a pull request like a senior developer. So I have been programming for, I actually don't even want to think specifically about how long it's been, but decades for sure. And working with GitHub and open source pull requests for quite a while. And also pull requests in my day-to-day -day work. We use them a ton at Titan. So I figured I would talk through a little bit about what it looks like when I get a pull request, whether it's at work or an open source project, and how I interact with that pull request and how I make it better, how I make it manageable for me, and basically what my workflow is of working through a pull request. All right, number one, the first thing I do is I actually just take a look at the description without looking at the code. I want to see what the pull request itself looks like and what information they've intentionally provided me that has nothing to do with this code because anything that you create in the pull request interface in GitHub or whatever else is specifically given to me to give me what I need to do to be able to re review it and for no other reason. Once this pull request is merged, the description, the title, anything added to the description, the comments, that's going to be disappearing for the rest of the future. I mean, it's going to stay in this pull request, but it's not a part of the code base. So if it is there, it is made for me. So I'm going to go take a look at the description. I'm going to look at the title. I'm going to look at any labels. I'm going to look at any links, and I'm going to try and understand things from there. Now, as you see from this particular one, this, this MES, Matt Stauffer guy did, um, there's not a lot going on there. And this is one of the most common frustrations you'll get with pull requests is people don't think about the fact that there's a human being on the other side. And so you're not getting these very useful things. And so one of the things I'll often do in this context is say, you know what, this is not going to be the moment for me to actually do the work for it. Knowing when you should do work and when you should push work back on the person who made the pull request is one of the hardest things to know how to do well when you're basically, um, when you're working with um, open source pull requests. Um, actually, when you're working with pull requests at all. So in this particular moment, there's so much missing. Is it connected to an issue? What is it actually doing? All that kind of stuff. So what I would say is probably I'd put in a comment there here that says something along the lines of, can you let me know what this is actually intending to do here? So I just basically leave a comment and just put a little bit of work back on their plate. If I want to be taking the work to review this thing, I want them to talk, talk to me about what it is. I also might say something like, link to any issues, etc. So let's imagine this person comes back and they say, oh, you know, uh, fixes issue or, you know, issue number three or something like that, right? So at least have a little bit of information. So at this point, like I talked about in my last video, our hope is that this person would have given us uh, instructions on how to set things up or, you know, these links to these issues or whatever else. But at least at this point, I now have the information tiniest enough bit of information to say, oh, wait, it's related to this right here. And even if people do a medium decent pull request, if they link to the issue, often that's just enough to give me this context. So I dig in here and I say, oh, pull something interest from my YouTube. So this is probably going to be about pulling something from YouTube. Second thing I'm going to do, and this is a very natural transition, is to look at the files changed. Because in this particular pull request, I'm assuming, based on what we clicked on here, that this is going to pull something interesting for my YouTube. But I'm not 100% sure. And the easiest way to know that for sure is to go over to Files Changed and see what has actually happened. So the second thing I do is read the code. So let's take a peek at the code real quick. And I'm not doing code quality analysis here. I'm just trying to see, OK, we've got uh, you know, a variable being set in the environments. Uh, we, we're pulling in a new package for YouTube. We're making some pretty significant changes to the home page. And here we go, the, the controller that sends data to the home page is getting a list of videos from a particular channel. Okay, so this makes sense. So what this is probably doing, and I will rename this title right away at the title, and I'm going to say, and even though I'm the one who created this, I could edit the title as a maintainer if somebody else created this. So I will say something like, you know, show top four videos from a YouTube channel on the home page. Pretty sure that's what's going on. So we're starting to build this out to be something that's a little bit more robust. Now, I can also edit their description if I want. Um, so I can go in and start, you know, fleshing that out. But for right now, I don't actually know what the next thing is. So we take a look at the description and any attached issues. Uh, we've asked for help if we needed it, and we've looked at the code. Um, one of the things that can help you at times understand what's going on, if the code doesn't always tell the full story, is you can take a look at the commit history. And you can say, well, what have they done to get here? All right, so this person started by adding a YouTube package, then they removed it. Then they required a different one, and then they added a YouTube API key, and then they added the YouTube home videos to the home page, 
and then they swapped it out to use .env for the YouTube channel code. Okay, so we can kind of like get a sense of what their development process was like to do that, okay? So that makes sense. I do see these commits and these commits make me go, we might wanna squash these. And we'll talk in a second about what squashing is. So the next thing I wanna be able to do when I'm working on reviewing a pull request is I want to be able to reproduce it locally. This is most important in a pull request like this, where I can't actually see how it's going to work based on the way they did the description. But even if with a great description, I usually want to be able to reproduce it locally. So what I do is I grab right here, I just click on the name of the branch, and then I'm gonna go over to my actual installation locally. I'm gonna go check it out. Actually, let me do this, git checkout, that right there. Uh, I just use GCO as a shortcut. So we now have this version locally. I don't remember there being any, oh, there is a composer dependency that's different. Remember, because they, they pulled in the new package, so you want to install the composer um, package. I also remember there being something about a YouTube API key, although I don't know how to um, do that YouTube API key, so we'll see if it breaks anything that I don't have it. All right, so I'm not 100% sure how this is going to work because I don't have any environment key set up because I didn't get instructions. Let's just see what happens when I go to tuber.test using valet locally. Okay. So we're assuming that we're getting some kind of complaint here. It says at least the search query or channel ID or video category ID must be supplied, okay? Um, and that's here. Okay, well, we're saying list channel videos and we need a YouTube channel code. Now, we do remember seeing a .env variable here, but it wasn't the right one. So we've got YouTube API key missing an equals afterwards. And then we've also got this YouTube channel code, which they forgot to add the .env.example entirely. So let's just test it out. Let's see what happens. I happen to have a YouTube channel of my own, so I'll just go grab the code for that uh, from over here. Paste it in. Oops. All right, so now we put a channel code in there. Let's see if we still get an error. Oh, error 400, API key not valid. So Again, this is a little bit clearer because at least we got this YouTube underscore API underscore key. We didn't get any directions on how to get them, but it's okay. The author assumed we knew how to do that. So I'm gonna go spend some time on my own. If I don't know how to get it, then I'm gonna put a comment in the thing. I'm gonna say, hey, I don't know how to get this key. Can you give me instructions? And then I'm just gonna disappear until they get back to me. I'm not gonna sit on a pull request and fuss over it when it's their responsibility to teach me how to do it. So I do happen to know how to get one. So let's go there. YouTube API key equals, and I don't, probably shouldn't put it on screen, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna cut this part and you can just trust me that it happened. All right, so I just put my YouTube API key in the .env and let's go take a look at now what happens. All right, great, so we have a functioning uh, way for this to work and I understand that something needs to change. This file right here needs to change and so, we do need YouTube API key, although we need an equals after it, but we also need YouTube channel code. So what I'll do often in here is I'm gonna come in and I'm going to just make a comment. And there's this wonderful tool in GitHub where you add a suggestion. They say YouTube API key equals YouTube channel code equals, and I'll start a review there. And the reason I'm starting a review is because that's probably not the only suggestion I want to make. Um, for example, uh, Right, so I'm giving instructions in here. I'm not gonna fix this stuff. This is enough. If it was just this little thing right here where I'm, it's just this, I'd just fix it myself. But this is the thing that when, this is gonna make it really easy for them to just accept this suggestion. And then this is right here is the actual work that they're gonna have to do. So once I've decided this is the review I'm gonna give, I'm going to say request changes. And my, oh, well, I can't do that because it's my own pull request. But I'm gonna say request changes because I want this person to, um, to fix it before they come back. And you could have automated rules on your GitHub repositories that say uh, request changes, uh, if it says, if it's not approved by X people or X number of people, it can't actually go forward. We don't do that at Titan because we're small enough that we just say, if it says request changes, then then make the changes you know, before you move forward. But you can build all these kind of complex systems around them. And then you submit the review and you can put some notes on it as well. So then again, I don't worry about it until they get back to me. And when they get back to me and then they fix this and they fix that and they fix the you know, the .env thing, then I have the chance to look over the code again, given the commit history of this person, it's probably gonna be about 17 more commits, and then decide what I'm gonna do with it next. Sometimes you're gonna do this process and when it's an open source, the person will never get back to you. And at that point you have to decide, am I gonna take this over 
Um, or the person might not know how to make the changes you're suggesting. So you have to say, am I going to take this over and I'm going to make the changes or not? Um, most of the time when somebody makes an open source pull request to a repo you're an admin of, you have the ability to add commits to that branch and to modify it, but there's a setting that they can do. I don't even remember where that setting is. I wish I'd looked it up beforehand. Let me look it up real quick and get back to you. All right, so here we go. In the pull request, when somebody creates it, there's a little checkbox that says allow edits from maintainers. And if somebody has checked that checkbox, that means I can actually push stuff up. If they've not done that, I can still make some changes. So let's say um, I'm really happy with your pull request and I need one change made and you didn't check this allow edits for maintainers. What I'll do is I'll just accept the merge, assuming that you weren't able to merge it directly into something that's going to go straight to a tag, right? Like usually if, so, if I merge something in, it's just sitting there on a branch and nothing has happened yet. It hasn't been deployed or it hasn't been, um, you know, tagged and released or whatever else. And then I can do the work I want to do on that branch and then do the deploy and then do the release, whatever it is. So it's still fine, but it's even easier when I can make the modifications directly in the branch that somebody requested. So let's say we were happy with it at this point. The next question we have to ask is, are we going to merge the pull request or are we going to squash and merge? To me, this has, or rebase and merge. To me, this has a lot to do with how effective of a committer are they? Because I like Git commits that actually kind of like tell the story of the development in a way that would be valuable to us as we look in the past. And some people say, you would never look in the past, you only look at pull requests. That's not actually true. I actually often look at commits and I learn about what was happening. But what I don't want is to learn the entirety of you added the YouTube package, you removed the YouTube package, then you required the new package, then you add the API key. This is too much. And you'll see a lot of people will just say, oops, fixed a mistake, fixed a bug, or whatever. I don't want that crap. And so if I'm seeing a lot of that, what I can do is instead of having all of these, I can just do a squash and merge. And this will basically merge them all together in a single um, commit that has the, the descriptions for each of the individual commits in its body. So they're all there, but it's kind of squashed together in one. Um, the other situation in which I might do something like this is it might be so bad or so old that I can't actually use GitHub to solve it. If you um, have ever run into the thing where it says this cannot be um, merged because basically a change has been made to the branch you're trying to merge into, it'll prompt you to basically use the, the GitHub interface to say, oh, this is how to merge these changes. And it'll do the little thing with all, all the arrows where it says, uh, th let's say you're trying to merge into the main branch and you made changes to the route definition or changes were also made to that route definition on the main branch. Then you're going to get into this weird spot where you have to say, this is the change. This is a way to reconcile the differences and you might not know. So that's a situation you might find yourself in. You're just going to have to get familiar with that. I can't do a whole video on that right now, unfortunately. But sometimes things get so old or what, or, or maybe things, it was a good idea that was so poorly written that you just don't have the ability to actually merge this pull request, but you want to redo it yourself and you want to give credit to the original author. There's this really cool thing that you can do in GitHub. It's easiest in GitHub desktop where you can basically have somebody who is your co-author of the pull request. So let me show you real quick how that works. So if you're making your commit locally and you don't want to use GitHub desktop, there's basically this syntax right here where you just say co-authored by and then their name and their email address. And that'll actually show up in the GitHub user interface with your icon and their icon right next to each other, which is pretty cool. But if you're doing it on GitHub desktop, you have the opportunity to say my commit title or whatever, and then you can add somebody else as your co-author. And so you can say, well, I was working on this project and Adam Wavin, you know, was the original, well, I'm not gonna say his stuff is bad, but let's say for some reason I wasn't able to merge some of Adam's code, then I come in here and then when I commit it and I push it up, this new work that I've done that represents the ideas he originally introduced, even though it's not his original pull request coming in, now he gets credit for having contributed to that. And it's some feature I really like about GitHub. And so that's it. Those are the steps that I, as an experienced senior developer, take when I'm merging a pull request. So remember, we take a look at the description, the title. We take a look at any linked issues and any other ideas they've given us. We take a look at the code. We try to make sure we can actually run the code lo locally. We have communications. We give approval or, or rejection um, to the thing. We leave comments. We ask for them to give a little bit more feedback. And then we handle any squash and merge issues, any conflicts, and maybe even have to rewrite the things ourselves. And eventually we get to the point where we're ready to merge that thing in. If the commits are good, we um, we just bring, bring them right in. The commits aren't so great, we squash it when we merge it. And then at that point, we're good to go. And I'll always say something like, you know, thank you for this, or, you know, uh, we really appreciate the work you put in here. And, you know, here's the release that I tagged in or whatever else. So they can know that their work actually kind of made it to production. 
So if there's anything else you want me to discuss about pull requests, especially in the GitHub world, uh, let me know. Um, you know, we covered how to write a good pull request and we covered how to review a pull request. If I come up with any good pull requests that come into any of my open source projects anytime in the near future, what I'll probably do is I'll probably uh, rev basically make a video of myself reviewing that project. Uh, it's been a little while since I've had one that really prompted me to want to make a video, but I'll see if I can find one coming up soon. But if anything else you want to learn about, any questions, any concerns, or any tricks that you use for reviewing your pull requests, leave them in the comments below or hit me up on Twitter at Stop Format. Until next time, see you later.